I'm going to read from Joshua chapter 23, uh, the whole chapter. But I'll be kind of looking a little bit at 24 as well, so sort of drawing that in. If you have a Bible, have it open before you so you can refer back. Uh, but uh, God's Word says to us, After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then old and well advanced in years, summoned Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered, between the Jordan and the Great Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God has promised. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must, ser you must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations, and to this day no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of the nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of the good promises of the Lord your God uh, gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as every pro good promise of the Lord your God has come true, so the Lord will bring on you all the evil he has threatened until he has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. It's God's word to us this morning. If I, if I say the name Alfred Nobel, uh, then my guess is that most of you are thinking the Nobel Peace Prize, right? Yeah, okay, and you would be correct to do that, all right? Just so in case you're thinking, oh, yeah, you would be correct to do that, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize is a, a prize that is given to individuals who are deemed to have conferred the greatest benefit on humankind in the year that lies, uh, that lies before. And it, it was something that Alfred Nobel uh, wrote into his will in, in about 1895. Um, and at the time, he, he set aside the vast majority of his wealth, which if you put it in today's value, it would amount to about 265 million pounds. It's a lot of money, right? So he set aside all of that wealth um, to, to you know, the, this charity and this prize and, and this work. But it was a wealth that he had amassed from the inventing dynamite. Uh, that's where he, he had made his money. And uh, although he never spoke about it publicly as to why he set up the, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, many biographers and people who sort of look at his life and so on, they, they will say that it was probably likely due to the fact of a, a, a crisis of conscience and a case of mistaken identity. Um, so the story goes that in 1888, uh, Alfred Nobel's brother, Ludwig Nobel, died of a heart attack in, um, in France. And so the newspapers heard about this, that, that he had died, and uh, one newspaper mistakenly thought, ah, it's Alfred Nobel who's died. And so they proceeded to write this um, uh, obituary but it was a seriously scathing obituary. Uh, in it, the author, the, the guy who wrote it, or the person who wrote it, said, branded Alfred Nobel as a merchant of death who had accumulated his wealth by developing new ways to mutilate and kill people. Uh, of course, later on, the error was found out, and they corrected their error and said, so, sorry, we got it wrong, wrong brother, right? But it wasn't before that newspaper actually came to Alfred Nobel. 
And so one morning, he goes down for breakfast, and he gets handed his newspaper. And while he's having his cornflakes or Weetabix, I don't know, he's, he's reading through the newspaper, and he gets to the obituaries, and he sees his obituary, his death notice, and begins to read his own death notice. And it said that from that moment, he had this crisis of conscience, which made him kind of rethink his career. And, and, and one biographer said he became so obsessed with his posthumous reputation that he rewrote his will, bequeathing most of his fortune to a cause upon which no future obituary writer would be able to cast aspersions. He would have what we would call in modern day language a wake up call, right? But it's a wake-up call that I think would center on one particular question that perhaps he was asking himself. And maybe the question would go something like this. Is this the story that I want to tell? The, the trajectory of my life, the direction that my life is moving in, is this the story that I want to tell? Is this the story that I want told of me? And it seems to me that when you get to Joshua chapter 23 and 24, Joshua He's old in years, you know, and he's standing before the, first of all, in chapter 23, he calls the leaders, the elders, the judges and officials. Then in chapter 24, he calls the whole nation together before him in Shechem. And, and he's saying to him, listen, you, you need to decide what is the story of your life going to sound like? What is the story that is going to be told of you. And, and, and to this end, he, he places before them, he says, I'm, I'm going to give you a choice in chapter 24. And he's, here's the choice. You, you can either fear God and serve him always, or you can choose to serve the, the gods with a small g from the nations beyond the river, uh, the, the nations of the Amorites. But, but you've got to decide. You've got to choose today who is it that you're going to, to serve. And, and you know, and I know that Every decision that we make in life, whether small or big, every decision that you make, it gets written into your story, right? Every choice that, that you and I make gets written into our story and is the story get, becomes a part of the story that we get to tell or the story that is told of us. If you look back through the book of um, the books that we've been reading and the different stories that we've been reading in the Old Testament, the principle shines up again and again and again. Do you remember when we looked at the story of Joseph, uh, particularly the part where he meets Mrs. Potiphar? Do you remember this part? And, and Mrs. Mrs. Potiphar likes the look of Joseph, and she tries to grab Joseph and force Joseph, and that's a decision she made. She was like, you've got to come to bed with me. And the story that gets told of her is, well, she's a liar. She's conniving. She's a would-be adulteress. And then you think about Joseph, and Joseph, when, when that moment happens, what did he do? He ran for the hills, right? He, ran for the, he turned around and he, he made this decision, and he said, no, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to abuse the trust of my master in that way, and I'm not going to sin against the Lord my God in that way. And he runs for the hills. And so what's the story that we tell about Joseph? Well, he's a man of character. Life squeezed him, and out came good character, integrity, faithfulness truthfulness, obedience to, to God. You think about Caleb. Do you remember Caleb? Caleb and, and, and Joshua, along with 10 other spies, they're the 12 spies. Do you remember 12 spies going to, into the promised land, right? Whose names do we remember? Joshua and Caleb. We don't remember the other 10 because they're the ones that says we, we said we can't do it, but we remember Caleb because he was like, no, we can do this. We can definitely do this. We, we can go in and we can take a hold of the land because God is going to be with us. And whenever you see Caleb's name, you're like, yeah, I remember Caleb. His story was one of strength, faithfulness, courage in the purposes that God had called him. What about the story of Achan? Paul that was preaching last week, he, he mentioned Achan, right? As they go into Jericho, God has told the people, you, you mustn't touch the devoted things. Don't touch any of the silver and gold. It's been devoted to me. But Achan opens up somebody's wardrobe, and there's this beautiful robe from Babylon. And he's like, I fancy that. I'm going to look good in that. And there's a whole lot of silver and gold at the bottom of the cupboard. I'm going to take that. You know, I'm going to buy me something nice. And he hides the, the, the money in his tent. And what is the story that we tell of Achan? That he was a fool. 
that he was greedy, that he found out that you mustn't mess around with the holiness of God and the commands of God. All these decisions that we make, they, they, they become a part of the story that we get to tell, and, and, and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. We can apply the same principle. The, the, the illustration I used this morning was uh, uh, really kind of applied because it was the, the eagles were in, and they were all like, you know, all of them have got PlayStation, probably, you know. Uh, but just imagine, right? You're preparing for your A level exams or your, your GCSEs or something like that, or university exams, right? And, and you've got a PlayStation, and the, the brand new game comes out on the Friday, and your friends phone you up and they say, We're going to pull an all nighter. Some of the adults are like, what's an all-nighter? Right? What is that? It's this crazy thing that young people do where they decide, you know what, I'm going to stay up all night and play games and eat sweets and, and I'm not going to go to sleep. Right? Uh, I always used to chuckle because our, our boys were like, Dad, can we pull an all-nighter? And we'd, Adele and I would be like, yeah, sure, fine. You know, do, knock yourself out. And by 2 o'clock you come downstairs and they're knocked out. Right? They, never, they tried many times and failed many times. Anyway. I'm going to put an all-nighter, but I should be studying. And there's a decision, there's a choice that needs to be made. Do I, do I stay up all night and play this game? And then I don't study the next day, which means that I don't get good marks on the exam, which means I don't get into the university I want to go to, and, 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 and. Or you can decide, no, do you know what? I'm going to defer my happiness... I'm going to defer my pleasure of playing this game until Tuesday, till after the exam. And I'm not going to pull an all-nighter, and I am going to study really hard. And so on the Monday morning, you write the exam, and you get an A-star. And because you've got an A-star, you get to go to the university that you want to go to. And at the university, you just meet that guy or that girl that's the guy or girl of your dreams. And five years later, eight years later, you get married. And then you have kids. And then you have grandkids. And one day when you're old and gray and wrinkly sitting in your conservatory, sipping I don't know, iced tea or something, you look back and you think, thank you, Lord. I never pulled an all-nighter way back then, right? Every, every, it's, I'm exaggerating. But every decision you make, it gets written into your story. And Joshua says to the people of, of God, he's like, what, what are you going to decide? What are you going to do? For Joshua, it's a decision that he's already made. In, in Joshua 24, 15, that there's that verse that you'll be familiar with because we sing songs about it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I always find it curious that, that Joshua, that phrase is mentioned at the end of Joshua's journey, when he's, when he's old and gray and about to go the way of the world, right? And he's saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I, I think that Joshua actually made that decision at the beginning of his journey. We're just not told about it. So I imagine Moses sitting down with Joshua one day and saying to Joshua, hey, Joshua, you know what? What's the plan for your life? What, what direction are you going to move in? What, what is going to be the thing that's going to keep you on the straight and narrow? And Joshua would have said, uh, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And every choice that I make, every decision that I make, Moses, it's going to have to pass through that filter. And if, if, if the answer is, can I do this and continue to serve the Lord, then, then the answer is yes. But if the answer is no, then the answer is no. And he gets to the end of his life and he's looking back and he's like, as for me and my house, he could say, it could have been written, as for me and my house, we have serve the Lord. We have done it. And Joshua's got this great story that is just so good to tell. And it, it begs the question from us, how did he do it? You know, if, if we're sitting here this morning, we're, we're reflecting on this passage of Scripture, we, we can ask ourselves the question, you know, what advice, what wisdom can we learn from Joshua that will enable us to be a people who, when we get to the end of our journey, can say, hey, I've got a story that's worth telling. What, what things did, did, did Joshua do that he tells the people of God to say to them, hey, listen, you do these things, and if you do these things, then at the end of the day, you're going to have a story that's worth telling. As you trawl through Joshua 23, there, there's various different highlights. Verse 3 to 5, Joshua is saying to them, hey, listen, remember, it's God who fights for you. Remember, remember God. Don't forget 
God. You, you want to you live a life where you're making good decisions so that you've got a great story to tell? Well, then here, it starts with this. Don't forget God. There's that story in Exodus chapter 17. I often go back to it because I think it was such a formational story for, for Joshua. You may remember the story. Joshua is fighting down in the valley against the Amalekites, and Moses is up on the hill. And he's praying, and as long as he's got his hands up and praying, Joshua is winning. But as soon as his hands go down, Joshua starts losing. So Aaron and Hur, they hold Moses' hands up, and at the end of the day, Joshua wins. And, and afterwards, there's that throwaway line where, where the Lord says, make sure you tell Joshua what's happened. And so you can imagine in the valley down below, everybody's gathering around Joshua and saying, you did it. High five, you've got such great fighting skills. You, you're such a boss. You're incredible. Thank God, oh, Joshua, Joshua, Joshua. And, and Moses comes up behind him and taps him on the shoulder. And he says, but Joshua, I just need to let you know something. You didn't win. It was God fighting for you. And in an instant, Joshua learns humility. It's not because of his battle prowess. It's not because of his strategy. It's not because of his skill. It's because of God. In an instant, he learns dependence and he learns trust in God. And he, he makes a decision, I think, in that moment. From here on out, I, I'm, I'm only fighting when, when God is with me. And, and I'm going to walk in such a way to make sure that God is always with me and always for me. And so he, he gets the leaders around. And he says, hey, you, you want to tell a good story? Don't forget God. Remember, it's God that fought for you. Remember, it's God that drives out the nations before you. Don't forget God. In a sense, he's drawing from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 where, where Moses is talking to the people and he, and he says to them, listen, uh, make sure that you don't be careful not to forget the Lord your God. And the word forget there, it, it, it means stop remembering or to ignore or dismiss from mind, abandon, neglect or cease to care about. And, and it's something we're always at risk of doing, isn't it? It seems to me that we're always one step away from moving in a direction where we forget God. Maybe we become too self-satisfied. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for me. Everything's going good at home and everything's going good in my everyday normal place. Life is great. And so what do we do? Oh, I don't need to pray so much and I don't need to read Scripture so much. And all of a sudden we've taken steps towards forgetting God. Maybe we become distracted by that new shiny thing, whatever that new shiny thing is, you know, that, that thing that promises you better life or more enjoyment. Uh, it could be a new series on Netflix or a new car or career or boyfriend, girlfriend, wh whatever, right? And, and all of a sudden, we're, we're stepping away from remembering what, who God is and what He's doing, and, and we're on this path towards forgetfulness. Maybe, maybe it's just we get overwhelmed by life. The the pressures of life, the stress of life, the frustrations of life, the distractions of life, the disappointments of life, and, and we forget everything that God has done. This, we do this all the time. We forget everything that God has done, and we're no longer thanking Him, but we, we're shaking our fist at Him. We're saying, God, when are you going to do something about this? When are you going to sort this out according to my plans and purposes, right? And as soon as we begin to do that, we're moving down this path towards Forgetting God, and, and, and Joshua's like, don't forget. Don't forget what God has done. Don't forget what God is doing in your midst. You take that truth and you put it into a New Testament context. And I could say to us this morning, brothers, sisters, don't forget who you were before you met Jesus. Don't forget the state of your life before you met Jesus. Don't forget the fact that you were at war with God. Don't, don't forget that there was once a stage in your life where you were an enemy of God because of your sinful behavior, because of your rebellion, because of your selfishness, because of pride, because of arrogance, expressed in all sorts of ways. Don't ever forget that you were deserving of the wrath of God, but God, who is rich in mercy, sent His one and only Son, Jesus, into the world. Don't ever forget that. And don't forget that Jesus lived the perfect life that you couldn't live and that I couldn't live. And then offered his perfect life as an atoning sacrifice on the cross so that a way could be made open that you and I could come in repentance and faith and be born again by the Spirit. Don't ever forget that God removed your heart of flesh and instead placed within you a heart, sorry, a heart of stone from within and placed instead a heart of flesh. Don't ever forget that God has poured out his Spirit 
into your life to move you to follow his decrees. Don't forget that you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. But we, we forget so quickly though, don't we? That's why Jesus, Jesus, in a sense, is doing what Joshua, Joshua is saying. Make sure you don't forget. And Jesus, standing with his disciples, he says to them, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. It's broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do, do, this, do this regularly. Do it regularly so that you don't Forget. Joshua would be saying to the people, look, you want, you want to make good decisions so that you've got a good story to tell at the end of your life? Number one, don't forget God. And then it's almost as if he's aware that there is this gaping hole that would lead people towards forgetfulness. And so in verse 6 through to 11, he, he shores up the road, if you like. Have you, have you ever dri driven on a mountain pass? You know, there's this sharp cliff edge. They've got a crash barrier, right? Joshua, in verse 6 through to 11, he puts up a crash barrier and a couple of signs that just say, you know, listen, don't go this way, right? Be careful that you don't go this way. He's giving them advice to make sure that they stay in the space where they don't forget who God is. And verse 6, the first thing is, be very careful. Be very careful and be strong to keep all the book of the law. I put those words into a, a modern, uh, into our context today, I, I would say it like this, immerse yourself in God's word. Immerse yourself in scripture. And this is, this is what we're trying to do in the culture of the life of this church. And, and you know, and, uh, last year we read through the, the New Testament, this year we're reading through the Old Testament, next year we're going to read through the New Testament again, and we're just going to keep going. And we're just going to keep encouraging one another to do this because, because we know that as, as long as we're immersing ourselves in God's word, we're going to be remembering who God is and what it is that he has done for us. There's a frightening contrast that is set up in, in scripture of when people don't walk in God's ways and then what happens when people do. One example is found in, in Amos chapter 8. Amos was a prophet from the southern kingdom of Judah who went to the northern tribes to tell them to repent and to turn back to God. And when you get to chapter 8, he, he speaks these words to the, to the people. He says, The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they're not going to find it. In that day, the lovely young women and the strong young men will faint because of their thirst. And so what Amos is saying to him is, listen, the word of God that you're ignored, it's, it's, you're not going to find it. And, and, and as a result, people are going to walk around in confusion and chaos. They're going to have no reference point. They're going to have no mooring. They're just gonna, looking for the north, they're not going to find it. Look for the south, they're not going to find it. They're just going to be wandering around. Isaiah the prophet puts it another way, talking about this confusion and saying that where, where God's word is not honored, it's kind of uh, people will call what's evil good and what's good evil. It's all manner of confusion that, that abounds when God's word is, is rare, when people don't walk according to to God's word. And then by contrast, you page back to the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, and the psalmist is effectively gushing with the good things that happen in our lives when we, when we do immerse ourselves in God's word. It's 176 verses celebrating the goodness of God's word. It's a, you immerse yourself in God's word, you're going to be blessed. You're going to experience salvation. You're going to grow in purity. You'll have a light for your feet. You're going to be protected and on and on and on. And on he goes and says, this is, this is what life looks like when you've immersed yourself in God's word. But perhaps most especially, you you'll be remembering who God is. You'll be remembering what God has done. Joshua puts up a guardrail. Next, he puts up a sign in verse 7, and he, the sign goes something like, like this. Don't, don't be influenced by the nations around you. Put it into modern-day language. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, culture is not supposed to influence you. You are supposed to influence culture. And verse 13 that, that Joshua uses is, or the narrator uses, it's, it's hand, what I would call handbrake language. Right? It's, it's language that is supposed to arrest us and make us kind of sit up and take notice. It's, it's the kind of language, or put in another metaphor, if, if you see a young child running for a busy road, you, you're not going to say to them, hey, come back, come back, right? You're going to grab a hold of them very strongly and yank them away from danger, right? And at that moment, they may be like, ah, daddy, that, that, was, that was sore. And you're like, well, the truck was going to hurt a lot more. And verse 13 is a little bit like that. It's saying, look, if, if you get influenced by the culture around you, it's going to be a trap and a snare for you. You think of how culture tries to influence us, and maybe you've heard the gentle whisper in your ear before. You don't have to wait. You can have whatever you want. You can buy it all now. You can get a shiny little piece of plastic that you don't even have to remember your code anymore. You can just tap it. And you can buy whatever you want, whenever you want. And, and you, can, you can enjoy it now and you can pay for it later. <laughs> and so we go tap, 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 tap. Uh, a chef that I used to work with, he was forever buying uh, all sorts of stuff. And I was like, John, how do, how do you afford this? And he was like, I just buy it on the never, never. I said, what's the never, never? I was like, it's my credit card, because I'm never, never going to pay for it. I was like, I'm pretty sure the world doesn't work like that. <laughs> they're they're going to come after you. At some point, somebody's going to come after you, and if not you, they're going to come after your kids, right? There's no such thing as a never, never. The, 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 they're going to want their money back at some point. And we tap, 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 because culture says, no, you can have it now, and then at the end of the month, the bills come, and all of a sudden, we're drowning under a mountain of debt, and there's a snare, and there's a trap. Do you get it? What about culture's whisper that says to us, hey, it's, it's your body. You can do anything you like with it. As long as it's consenting adults and all that sort of thing, you can do whatever you like with your body. And so people buy into this nonsense and then wonder why it feels like they've got a whip that is whipping their back as they get chased by all manner of shame and guilt and all sorts of difficulty. The moment that we move away from the moorings of God's word into something different, the moment we allow culture to influence us, it's going to be a snare, it's going to be a trap, it's going to be a whip for our back, it's going to be thorns for our eyes. So Joshua puts up the sign and he's saying, listen, don't go down this way. If you allow culture to influence you, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to forget God. And he says, I've got one more thing to tell you which will help you to remember who God is and what it is that God has done. And it's down in verse 11. He, he's, he effectively says, just love God. Love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love God. Steward all your affections towards God. And, and, and here's the thing. You know this. I know this. It's this is, not a, this is not a McDonald's drive through meal. All right? This is not something you chuck in the microwave for two minutes and bing, and it's ready kind of thing. You know? This is going to take time. If you're going to steward your affections towards the, the, the Lord God Almighty, it's going to take time. But we do that by avoiding sin. We steward our affections to, toward God by by avoiding sin and by realizing that only Jesus is able to fulfill or meet the deepest longings in our hearts. Sin will entice us away, won't it? It will entice us away and, and, and for a moment it feels great, right? I mean, sin wouldn't be tempting if it wasn't nice, you know. But there's always a mess afterwards, isn't there? We need to walk in God's ways in obedience to his commands. And as, as we do this, as we walk in obedience to his commands, we, you will feel God's pleasure. 
This is the strangest thing. When, when I know from my own experience in life, when I am walking in God's ways and the ways that He wants me to walk, oh man, you feel His pleasure. But when I don't, it's like a cloud goes over the sun. It's like there's a cool breeze that just comes and blows through my life. We, we need to spend time with Him. Daily, intentional time where we immerse ourselves in His Word, where we delight in Him in worship, where we abide with Him in prayer, and then in doing so, we see and savor the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus. And, and we become so captivated with that, that everything else is, is secondary. Everything else doesn't, doesn't entice us in the same way. Because like, why, why would I turn my gaze away from the God who is all glorious and all magnificent to be, you know, drawn away by finite things that don't bring me to life, that actually just bring me to death? We, we need to continue to trust God when, when, it, when, when, the, when everything is going easy and it's easy to trust God. When everything's going good, we're like, yeah, it's easy to trust God. And, but also when things are going difficult. And in those moments, to speak over our lives, God is good all the time. And all the time? Exactly. Just remind ourselves again and again and again, He can be trusted. He is good. His plans and purposes for me are perfect. We need to care only for His approval. Sometimes the voices around are so loud. They're so loud and... and it's difficult not to listen to them, and we, we need to make sure that we're listening for His approval. To walk in such a way that when we lie down at the end of the day, the voice that we're hearing is not the voice of the crowd and everything like that, but the, it, it's His voice that says to us, You are my son. You are my daughter, whom I love, and with you I'm well pleased. This is how we steward our affection toward Him, avoiding sin, walking in His ways, trusting Him in all things, daily nurturing time with Him, listening for His voice and His voice alone above all the other voices. Joshua's message to the people in chapter 23 and 22, he's saying to them, hey, listen, you want to tell a good story? You want your life to tell a good story? Here's, here's how you do it. Remember God. And to encourage you to remember God, you can immerse yourself in God's Word. And don't let culture shape you. You shape culture. And steward all of your affections towards Him. And, and notice that Joshua, he's not, grabbing, he's not grabbing a leaf out of Moses' book. He's not saying, this is what Moses did. He's saying, this is what I've done. This is what I've done. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Better yet, as for me and my house, we have served the Lord. And so as a result, we've got a story that's worth telling. As Chris and the team come up, I'll perhaps leave you with two closing thoughts in this regard. The first one is, Maybe as I've been talking, you've been thinking to yourself, oh, I've made so many bad decisions. I've made so many bad decisions, and it's resulted in a story that I'm, I'm a little bit em embarrassed to tell. I don't want to tell other people about. Can I just say, if, if, if any of that refers to life before Jesus, then it's all been redeemed. If before Jesus, you met Jesus and put your trust in Him, you were making bad decision after bad decision, which led to a story that just isn't very pleasant and isn't very nice. Hey, the moment that you came and you met Jesus and your life was brought from darkness into light and you were forgiven of all of your sin, He also redeemed your story. And so now, all of a sudden, like Paul, if you go read the book of Acts, when Paul tells his story to the kings and the rulers and the, the kind of... the the, the movers and the shakers of the time, Paul says to them, hey, let me tell you about my life before Jesus. I was a persecutor. I was a murderer. I did all of these despicable things. I hated the church, but then I met Jesus. And now I'm a child of God, and I'm his servant. In other words, he's saying, hey, look at what the Lord has done. Friends, brothers, sisters, you've got a story. 
You've got a story that needs to be told. There are people in your everyday normal place where you spend most of your time, people in your family, people on your front line who don't know Jesus, and you, you need to say to them, hey, listen, this is, this is what my life was like. But then I met Jesus, and he forgave me of all my sin, and he gave me a heart of flesh, and he put his spirit within me, and this is what my life looks like now. He's made all the difference. You've, you've got a story to tell. But the second thing that I'd say this morning is, is this. That maybe, maybe some of you are facing a real big decision. And this morning, this word has come to grab you by the arm and to pull you back from the brink of making a bad decision. To make you just pause in this moment for a second and to say, hey, whatever the outcome of this decision is, is it going to result in a story that I'm still happy to tell? Will it result in a, in a story that's worth hearing, the story that is told of me by others? I'm sure that we all want to get to the end of our time and be able to say, hey, let me tell you my story. So maybe this is a moment for us just to pause and to ask the question, are the decisions that I'm making at this moment, is it going to result in a story that's worth telling?